Joining me now is the director of the White House Office of Management and Budget, former co Congressman Mick Mulvaney. Director Mulvaney, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Jake, good morning. Thanks very much for having me. So did anything actually change at the Bureau of Labor Statistics in terms of methodology or who is running the business there? Hey, what I think changed is you start to look at some of the underlying numbers. You look at the U6 number. We can talk. I'm already boring your audience. There's things like U3, U6. And what you, what you should really look at is the number of jobs created. We've thought for a long time, I did, that the Obama administration was manipulating the numbers in terms of the number of people in the workforce to make the unemployment rate, that percentage rate, look smaller than it actually was. And we used to tell people back home, the only thing you should really look at, number of jobs created. And as long as that number is above $250,000, the economy is doing extraordinarily well. And that was the number we hit last week. But just to, I don't want to spend the whole interview talking about this, but just sure. to point on it, you're not the one that was, that, that was attacking the numbers as phony. Um, there's nothing that changed that made them real today. No, the, the BLS did not change the way they count, I don't think. But you could have a long conversation when you've got a, a numerator and a denominator, how to arrive at a percentage. But again, I don't want to bore people. This isn't a claim that you made, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, you recently spoke about President Trump's budget, and you said, quote, we're taking his words and turning them into policies and dollars. I want to follow up on that because he, there were a lot of words said during the campaign. So the president one time said that he believed taxes should actually go up on the wealthy. Take a listen. Do you believe in raising taxes on the wealthy? I do. I do, including myself. I do. The plan uh, to repeal and replace Obamacare would do the opposite of that. Uh, it would deliver roughly $157 billion over the coming decade to those with incomes of $1 million or more, according to the nonpartisan Joint Committee on Taxation. Isn't that breaking the promise? Uh, a, a couple of different things. First of all, when we talk about taxes, there's more than just one tax out there. The Obamacare taxes are not the only taxes that anybody pay. Uh, we did promise, the president did promise, to repeal those, and we are repealing them in this proposed bill. Uh, as we get further down the road and start talking about other tax reform, the president, just as recently as last week, reaffirmed to me he wants to uh, repeal the tax incentive on what they call carried interest, which overwhelmingly benefits the wealthy. So I don't think the two things are inconsistent. If you're going to talk about tax policy, you're going to play that clip, you should look at the overall tax policy, um, not just the changes to the Obamacare. Okay, so look at it in the aggregate after the year is done or two years are done. I think that's fair. And we're just in the, in the very early stages now of developing that larger tax policy. Let's talk about health care reform as health care reform, not necessarily as standalone tax policy. But you think, that, you think that this tax cut does not break that promise because there might be tax increases such as the hedge fund manager's tax that Absolutely. we're talking That's about. That's correct. Uh, when President Trump, uh, then candidate Trump, was about to enter the race, he made a pledge not to cut Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. Take a listen. I'm not going to cut Social Security like every other Republican, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to cut Medicare or Medicaid. The plan to repeal and replace uh, Obamacare would roll back the expansion of Medicaid mm -hmm. um, that has provided coverage to more than 10, 10 million people in 31 states. Wouldn't that also be a broken promise? He is touching Medicaid. Just because you spend less money on something doesn't mean it can't get better. In fact, the private sector does that all the time. The phone you have in front of you is cheaper now than it was before, but it's a better quality than it was before. And that's one of the things we're trying to drive into Medicaid as part of this discussion about replacing Obamacare. We're trying to make Medicaid a lot more efficient. We met with, I think, 46 governors just about two weeks ago, and one of the things they asked us for on Medicaid and on many other things was more state control over what government sends them. I was in the state legislature several years ago. We would have loved to have more control over our Medicaid spending. But right now, under Obamacare, under the existing Medicaid rules, Medicaid is this one-size-fits-down, Washington-knows-best type of approach. And we think with this bill, we would give more control to the states and allow them to drive efficiencies that would increase quality and also reduce cost. But I'm not just talking about the block granting of Medicaid. I'm talking about rolling back the Medicaid expansion, which is supposed to happen in 2020. It might even happen sooner uh, if uh, some House conservatives get their way. Isn't rolling back the Medicaid expansion touching Medicaid? Yeah, the, the blueprint that we've seen phases that out. doesn't kick anybody off. The president has said he doesn't want to leave, kick anybody off in the, in the, the uh, proposal that we're working but how on. But how does that now, work? Does that. Well, folks typically don't stay on Medicaid very long. Some people do, but most people rotate off of Medicaid. It's part of the ordinary course uh, of life. Medicaid is there when you need it for the truly indigent poor. But folks, um, I think the number we use is someplace between three and five years is the average um, roll-off. Do you think the 10 million people that now have Medicaid because of the Medicaid expansion 
will be gradu will gradually go off and on their own? That, that's what all of the statisticians 10 million? will tell you, that the folks act, don't spend their entire life on Medicaid. Some people do, but when you start talking about large numbers of people, they typically don't. Um, as you know, there are a lot of conservatives who are not a fan of the health care plan as it exists right now. Former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin had some harsh words telling uh, Breitbart News that it's rhino care. She said, quote, there is still an aspect of socialism to this plan. She predicted that President Trump will step in and fix it. Is she right to think that President Trump and you and Dr. Price at Health and Human Services will make the bill right now that Speaker Ryan's put forward more conservative and less rhino care, as she puts it? Sure, and uh, there's some wonderful names from people who don't have to defend it, right? Um, anyway. Nobody's the, uh, calling it Trump care or Ryan care. Nobody's putting their name on it. Here's what we've got. We have a framework. We have a really, really good bill um, that the White House did work with House and Senate leaders to come up with. But we encourage the House and the Senate to try and make the bill better. We've laid out the things that the president needs. It must repeal as much of Obamacare as it can, given these strange and arcane Senate rules that we have to use. And it must do as much re replacement as it possibly can. The president was very clear on the campaign trail. He wanted to repeal and replace. That's what the framework does. Repeals as much as possible and gives us as much replacement as possible. If the House and Senate think they can make that bill a little bit better through the process, that's what this legislative process is about. And it's the legislative process that didn't exist for Obamacare. We've already had two hearings uh, in the House on this bill. I think there's another one this week. There'll be another one next week before it comes to a final vote. And that's even before it goes over to the Senate. So there's plenty of opportunities to make the bill better. I don't know what you mean. I keep hearing this from Republicans. It's a legislative process that didn't happen under Obamacare. Sure. Obamacare was a year-long process, and there are many, many committee hearings. I understand that a lot of people don't like it, but what's different about this legislative process? Um, you can go read the bill, for one thing. Um, could never do that with Oh, because it's up on the it, website. It's there. Anybody can read it. Folks watching on television now can go online and read what the bill is. They can watch the committee hearings. Uh, those are things that, that were dramatically missing in Obamacare. Director Mulvaney, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Good luck. Hope to have you on again soon.